You don't have to settle for a job that makes you unhappy. And you don't have to go through the pain of searching through millions of job listings. Hired.com brings job offers to you, the engineer. Hired is a job marketplace built for the engineers. A few years ago, I was unhappy with my engineering job. I felt stuck, I felt underpaid, I felt alone, and I didn't know my value in the job marketplace. It's a very opaque market. So I used Hired.com to find a new position. Hired connected me with a talent advocate who guided me through the process, like a free concierge. They made me feel valued. It was like a white glove service. And this talent advocate helped me with all the questions I had. Should I ask for more money? Should I consider relocating to try to get a higher salary or a better job? The talent advocate that you get paired with on Hired.com helps you with all these kinds of questions. I got several job offers, and I found one that was a good fit. In fact, engineers who use Hired.com get an average of five offers from great companies like Facebook, Uber, and Stripe, and the companies are bidding on you to try to get the best engineers, and so you end up with the higher salary. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily for a $4,000 bonus upon signing up. It is completely free to engineers looking for a job. I've interviewed the founder of Hired, Matt Mitchkovich. He also started 99designs and SitePoint. He's a software engineer, and he understands that engineers deserve the leverage in this super competitive market where great engineers are at a premium. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily. I'm happy to advocate Hired to my listeners because it puts power in the hands of engineers. Now let's get on with the show. David Heinemeyer Hansen is the creator of the Ruby on Rails web framework, and he's a partner at Basecamp. David, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me. It's been more than 10 years since Ruby on Rails was open sourced. In your eyes, what have been the biggest changes to the world of software engineering since that time? Wow, that's a good broad question. Uh, So many things have happened over those 10 years, but to pick out of just a few highlights that I think uh, have affected my work the most, uh, I'd say first the uh, introduction and popularization of Ajax uh, in what, 2004, 2005, um, XML, HTTP request and all that it brought with it, uh, that we weren't just going to do full page request changes and so forth. Then probably the introduction of the iPhone, um, native apps being something that uh, we had to think about first, just from a perspective of making the web applications work on a small screen, and then later on making the web applications work inside of uh, native apps. Um, Mm. On top of that, I'd say probably the rise of client-side MVC, um, big honking JavaScript frameworks where <laughs> all of the view was being generated on the client side. And then perhaps finally a trend, uh, func- the rise of functional programming as a, as a major factor again. Right. So when you started Ruby on Rails, there was kind of a set of canonical developer problems that you wanted to solve. And it seems like as time has gone on, the canonical developer problems have uh, evolved uh, in line with the trends that you just mentioned. Are there any canonical developer problems that uh, drove how Rails has changed over the past decade? So Rails from the beginning has been driven by extraction, by making real applications. And the real application that I've been mostly working on for the past decade plus has been Basecamp. And we've gone through a couple of iterations of Basecamp. Obviously, the first version of Ruby on Rails was extracted from that first version of Basecamp back in 2004, which was a version of Basecamp that didn't have Ajax, it didn't have native apps, it didn't have any of these trends that we talked about uh, came in later. But then over the years, we sort of adopted those and, and Rails developed alongside it, first with the introduction of Ajax and pulling JavaScript in as a major component of a, of a main of a web app. Um, and then over the years, expanding and, and serving not just the 
aspects of Basecamp that made sense, but for all these other applications that uh, that started using Ruby on Rails. Um, so while the the formation and, and my continued interest has purely been, or not purely, but primarily been the extraction of functionality from Ruby on Rails and turning that into frameworks, just so many other people showed up. I think at this point we mm. have uh, something like 4,200 people who've contributed code to Ruby on Rails, which is just an mm. astounding number. Uh, and that's, of course, just a tiny subset of the hundreds of thousands of people who've been developing applications with Ruby on Rails and the tens of thousands of gems that have been built on top of it. Mm, very interesting. So you mentioned Basecamp, and you recently released Basecamp 3, which is an entire rewrite of the application. And I'm curious why you rewrote the entire application from scratch, because I thought that was some kind of developer heresy. I think it very much is. Um, and I think uh, that's still the notion that's stuck in people's mind. I did a presentation recently covering this whole topic of rewriting an app from scratch. Uh, Basecamp 3 is actually the second time we've rewritten uh, Basecamp from scratch. Uh, the first time was was Basecamp 2 we started working on in 2010. Uh, and the underlying driver for this in both cases was that we wanted Basecamp to do something else than what it was doing. And by doing something else, I meant that we wanted to reconfigure the application the functionality that was within it in drastic, radical ways that the current user base would not have been happy with if they had just, from one day to the next, reloaded their web browser or, or their native app and then saw an entirely new interface. That goes over very poorly in the vast majority of cases. <laughs> People do not like to have their entire workflow um, turned upside down from one day to the next without their consent. So we realized that if we wanted to make major progress, if we wanted to compete with our very best ideas, with our very best implementation, that required us to do drastic things that were not just going to fit within the existing structure of the applications that we had. Mm -hmm. So that drove things from a business and design perspective, which then in turn drove things on the code perspective. You could have said, well, just because you want to change the UI doesn't mean you necessarily have to change the underlying code base, but I think it does. If you do want to make radical change to how the app works, then it usually also stands that those radical changes are going to be just as radical uh, under the hood. Mm -hmm. So we decided that the best way forward, after actually experimentation, in both cases, both with Basecamp 2 and with Basecamp 3, I started out with a hypothesis that perhaps we can make the existing code base work. And it didn't take very long for me to try to make the new designs that we had dreamt up work within the existing structure to realize actually it's more work to turn a table into a chair than it is to just make <laughs> a damn chair. So I think in general, the programming community just has a tendency to overvalue existing code bases. And for good reasons. It's not without reason that people don't want to willy-nilly rewrite their app. Uh, yeah. Lots of applications have long histories and of, of fixing bugs, of rounding out edge cases. And there's a lot of institutional knowledge and value in those code, ba code bases as long as they're doing the same thing. Mm. And I think that that's where rewrites got a bad rep, was programmers to some extent, just thought, well, I don't want to work with this code base anymore, which in many cases was just um, code for, well, someone else wrote this code and I don't like how it looks. So I'm just going to rewrite from scratch and then it's going to be better. And obviously that turned out poorly in many cases and it set organizations way back. One of, I think, the great examples of this is the rewriting that usually happens when companies or startups are acquired and they have to move their infrastructure somewhere else. I was just reading this article about Sappos and after Sappos was acquired by Amazon, at some point Amazon came in and said, all right, now it's time for you guys to move all your shit over to our platform, <laughs> which was basically a whole rewrite of the whole thing, right? Which meant that at least at the time of writing for that article, they had been working on that transition for two and a half years 
just porting things over to Amazon, not making a new application, just making existing things run on a new technical infrastructure, as in rewriting the entire thing just to fit a new technical paradigm, right? And in the meantime, they've just been standing still. Yeah, I think that's generally a really bad idea to just stand still uh, in the market like that. But right. that, wasn't the, that wasn't the intention. That was not why we did it. We did not declare code bankruptcy, which I think that's the, that's the metaphor that really stuck with a lot of programmers, mm. that you can accumulate technical debt to the point that you cannot make reasonable progress anymore. And when that happens, you declare code bankruptcy and you start rewriting the whole thing. Right. Okay. So, so let me ask you this. So, I feel like a lot of times where uh, you know companies or organizations are faced with this uh, question of should we rewrite it, they say, okay, we're going to strip out things into microservices or something like that. Um, yeah, now you have a thousand problems instead of. Then you have a th- then you have a thousand problems. Um, was your kind of hedge against that? It sounds like since you were you're not declaring code bankruptcy, did you find the areas of the code where you could just like copy paste it into the new version of the code? Um, it's funny because most of the copy pasting that goes on sharing things between base camps is the copy pasting that goes from base camp into Ruby on Rails. <laughs> that is basically what I'm doing with Ruby on Rails. I am extracting the generic elements of base camp and putting them into my toolkit. That was part of the motivation all along. So I said, if I had to create a new app from scratch, I wouldn't be starting from scratch. I'd be starting from, uh, the tool set that included the very best of everything I needed, which meant that we didn't really copy that much Basecamp specific code over. Now, okay, oh no, sorry, sorry. I, I think my question was probably unclear. So I was talking about the migration from from Basecamp two to Basecamp three. Um, did did you like it, during that rewrite process? Like, I'm really curious about the management of the rewrite process sure. and how you re- reused code in that process. So I think actually rewrite is a a little bit of a wrong term because rewrite assumes that you start from something and turn it into something else. We didn't. We started from blank slate. I did Rails new BCX was what (laughs) the uh, repo at the time, right? So I started from a blank application and that application then got built up from scratch as though I was creating a brand new application that, that didn't have an ancestor in that sense. Now, that doesn't mean I did not get inspired by some of the things we did in early versions of Basecamp or even to minor degrees copied over some code. But usually when I copied over some code, I saw that as a failure, that that was uh, extractions that should have happened. I should have pulled these out into gems earlier or, or whatever. There was not a lot of business logic that got copied over. And a, a big part of that was, of course, because we wanted to do different things. So the business mm. logic was the part that we wanted to do different. All the things that were the same, the structure of how you create a good web application, those are the things I've been putting into Ruby on Rails over the past 10 years. Mm. Okay, that's really interesting. You know, I think one thing that's interesting about Rails is that Rails, the the early growth of Rails when it really was growing in popularity kind of coincided with what some people call Web 2.0. And um, I think one of the things that was going on during this time is a lot of people were writing applications that were kind of solving similar problems, and Ruby on Rails uh, satisfied those set of problems really well. So I'm curious how you think that this confluence of events of uh, more and more people writing applications in this Web 2.0 time, how did that affect the direction of Rails? Uh... Good question. I I think sometimes it's easy to want to search for causation and correlation. And Mm. some of it was just that Web 2.0 was just the buzzword that people were applying to basically the period from, what, 2004 to 2008. Uh, It was not really prescriptive in many ways as much as it was just descriptive of a time period. And Mm. part of that was a couple of technical advancements, Ajax. I think was probably one of the primary there. And another thing was just the launch of a a new batch of applications that was simply new because they were launched at that time and that they weren't the applications from from the late 90s, early 2000s. So that was things like Basecamp or Flickr or whatever else that you have that sort of came after the dot-com bust. So I think Web 2.0 basically just became like a line in the sand and said, uh, like, there's the stuff that was launched before the dot-com bust, and then there was the stuff that was launched after. I don't really know if 
there is that much otherwise of a correlation, except to say that at the time that this was going on, uh, Ruby on Rails, well, first of all, got to popularize a language that was not popular before Ruby on Rails. So Ruby on Rails really brought Ruby to the forefront of development and gave a lot of programmers an excuse to try it. And there's lots of programming languages around that never sort of make it anywhere because programmers don't have an excuse to try it. Um, it's an academic exercise to explore it, and that's fun, and lots of people enjoy that. I'm not one of those people, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't just explore programming languages and build something substantial in it just for the sake of it. Mm. How I drive my learning is I want to build something real. So anyway, oh, okay. Ruby and Rails gave a lot of programmers sort of that opportunity with Ruby, right? And it also came at a time where there just weren't full stack frameworks around. Uh, the majority of sort of framework building was going on in these heavy 90s platforms like Java, right? Like a lot mm -hmm. of the inspiration from the, for the framework perspective and building uh, toolboxes in that way came from Java, but Java was just an incredibly hostile environment for programmers <laughs> to work in, um, oppressive even. Uh, so a lot of the initial... Especially new programmers. Yeah, I mean, once you've been boiled long enough, if you're the frog where the temperature is slowly <laughs> going up, you don't notice that it's actually hell hot down there in the pot. And mm -hmm. I think that described a fair number of uh, Java programmers at the time who... I was involved with a fair number of discussions and people who actually legitimately defended... Um, J2EE and uh, uh, Beans and, and the whole notion of craziness that was going on in time, like uh, uh, XML configuration files that were as big as the entire code base of, uh, of, Ruby, or of uh, Basecamp when it launched, uh, not to uh, mention Ruby yeah. and Rails. So there was kind of, there was a lot of intellectually interesting work going on in Java. It was just trapped in this nasty environment. And it really, in, in my opinion, just needed to be liberated. It was not that the thought product that was going on was bad. Uh, quite the opposite. A lot of the ideas were really good. They were just being implemented in an environment and in a programming language and ecosystem that was, I mean, horrid to, yeah. to sort of put my spin on it. And at the same time, we had sort of other things going on with PHP or Perl or so on that just didn't have that rigor, right? People weren't building huge frameworks, certainly you know, full stack frameworks in PHP at the time. Um, so there was absolutely a market opportunity to put it in marketing terms for Ruby and Rails to come in and basically just take a bunch of good ideas from Java, put it in a much nicer environment, a, a language that was specifically designed to be around programmer happiness. And then voila, um, there was something incredibly appealing for mm. people on both sides, right? Like the PHP programmers, we attracted a lot of the Perl programmers. They came from a little more freewheeling style. Let's let's put it like that. And they got to enjoy all that rigor and uh, the whole notion of the framework building. And then all the people from, from the Java world uh, sort of got to be liberated from Java and then still got to use the framework ideas and, and so forth. Yeah, you can bring your own rigor to Rails if you want to. Well, Rails provides a ton of rigor. I think that was actually a lot of the pitch that was uh, the sale was that Rails was full of rigor in the mm. sense that it was uh, it had thought about a very, very wide array of problems that everyone building modern web applications face. And that's what's continued to drive the development, right? That uh, some frameworks and some libraries have a micro approach. They want to solve one problem very well. And then they say, well, that's just what we do. And then if you want to create a whole solution, go shop for another 20 micro libraries and string those <laughs> together with whatever glue you see fit. And perhaps you end up with a nice system. Rails was very explicit and remains very explicit in many ways, controversially so, by saying, no, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to present you with an integrated system where each individual component is nowhere near as important as the entire picture, as the entire system. That full stack framework means we own the problem end to end. So we don't let things fall into the crack where mm -hmm. frameworks at the time could say, well, that's not on my table. Like the 
that's an ORM problem. No, that's a template system problem. No, that's a controller problem. No, that happens in the servlets. Like there's a lot of ways to shift blame around when no one owns the entire experience. Mm. That's one of the parallels I've been drawing lots of inspiration from with what Apple have been doing, right? That they've been doing all this um, integration. Uh, integrating everything from hardware to software to services to the selling experience. So Rails tries to do much of the same by integrating as many pieces of the stack that seems reasonable. Um, and that the big part of the value comes in that integration. It's not just individual parts that are nice, which I would say that they are, but where Rails is controversial and different from a lot of other frameworks is this explicit target of like, we're going to own the whole thing which is a very large and hairy and fuzzy problem. And it has no clear boundaries, which is something that programmers generally loathe, right? right. Uh, we get this uh, charge all the time. Rails is becoming too big and sort of too sprawling and, and so forth. And then when you dive into it and you ask, oh, okay, so which part of Rails would you like to kick out? Um, there's usually not as much <laughs> concrete uh, element to it. There's just this feeling. Programmers love tiny nice things that have clear boundaries and rails doesn't have that like the boundary is explicitly unclear at right. least to some extent that we will solve all the generic problems that people building modern web applications face together right okay so we talked a bit about languages or you, you mentioned some different languages and um i asked on twitter if people had questions for you and a, a listener named manjunath shankar asked what language you would use if you were making Rails today. And you actually responded to the tweet, so I didn't even get a chance to ask you this question, but you answered it, thankfully. So you responded that you would still use Ruby if you if you were building Rails today. That would still be the language you would use because you, quote, haven't found a language that better fits your brain. And um, I, I'm curious how well JavaScript fits your brain. That's a, That's a good one because I think... Not so much JavaScript, actually, which is funny because that's sort of what it boils down to. But CoffeeScript, I would say, is probably my second most favorite language to write stuff in. Um, it's a pretty distant second, I'd say. Ruby, to me, is still a very superior experience. Um, but I, I don't... What does that mean, fitting your brain? It means that when I sort of think in programming, when I try to design beautiful code that speaks to me in ways of clarity and conciseness and all the attributes we would use to describe good programs, Ruby is the language that most easily allows me to get there. On top of the fact that it invites me in as a co-creator of the language. This whole notion that uh, Ruby allows monkey patching, reopening of existing classing, including the core classes, is um, very important to this point for me. That I basically, Ruby allowed me to build a dialect of Ruby, the one that uh, you use when you use active support, that was specifically tuned for the use with Rails for building web application, that that dialect uh, the freedom to create that dialect, and not just the freedom to create a dialect, but to put the dialect on an even keel, that there is no preferred, when you look at a piece of code, you can't tell what was from the core or standard library and what was from my dialect. That is a level of respect for the co-creators of the language that I've not, is, is not typical in most other languages. Mm -hmm. There are other languages to sort of allow this and in JavaScript, you can do things with prototypes and so forth. But it is most natural, I find it, in Ruby. That's just one of the reasons. I, I think whenever you try to sum up uh, why is Ruby a beautiful language, you could think of it in, in the same way of, of why is French a beautiful language and why is German not? Um, it's not just one thing. E e it's hard to point to a single feature and say, oh, that's why. There are many mm. contributing features and factors, as I said, open classes or blogs or uh, I'd say perhaps one of the things that I find uh, most endearing is that Ruby has no single paradigm. Yes, it's an object oriented language, but it also is very at home with the procedural style. It's very at home with a functional style. It borrows a lot of concepts and ideas from a lot of other environments and somehow fits it into this quilt where you just 
look at it and go, wow, that was just what we needed for just that one thing, which is something I can very much recognize in how we build Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails is not a single paradigm framework either. Much, again, to the annoyance of many programmers who I think have a natural inclination to a very modern approach to things where you take one idea and then you drive that idea all the way through. I think mm. that's the appeal of functional languages that allow for only that approach to be used. That's the appeal of even uh, languages like Smalltalk that say like keywords are bad and like everything should just be message passing and so forth, where both Ruby and Rails say, no, there's good in all the paradigms. Mm. If we can mix and match the areas where they make most sense, we get the sum and the benefit from all of them, which is far greater than the benefit from any one of them individually. Right. Okay. So we've done some shows on Software Engineering Daily where we've discussed Rails and we've discussed it in contrast with full stack JavaScript. And the discussion always turns to a conversation about programming with a single language like a full stack JavaScript framework versus programming in an application that can use multiple languages like uh, uh, tend you know rails applications tend to be like this so yes. in your in your ideal world would every program be written in one language absolutely not i think this goes exactly to the heart of the discussion we just had that having multiple paradigms having multiple languages is a good thing not a bad thing i get that there are a lot of programmers who are very attracted to this modern idea of the of the single idea you can drive through everything right that you can use JavaScript on server side and on the client side and in every places, and that's a good thing. There are people who want to push this on the Ruby side. There are people who would like to write Ruby on the client side. Um, and I say, best of luck to you guys. Uh, that's not what I enjoy. I enjoy the languages and the paradigms and the concepts where they fit and where they make sense. So to give some example, I think SQL is a great language for writing complicated queries. There's a lot of ORMs that try very hard to hide the fact that they compile down to SQL because they want the single idea to flow all the way through. Well, in Rails, we've certainly eaten away at it every now and then, but uh, or not every now and then, continuously. So do you need to use less and less SQL? But it's still right there and it's right at your fingertips. And there are times where that's just the most appropriate language. The same goes for something like the, the view layer. Um, we use a procedural style that's very similar to PHP, where all the helper methods in the view in Rails is one big namespace. It's basically PHP, right, in the view. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's a wonderful concept for that specific purpose. Wouldn't work if you played it out over an entire app and structured all your code in that way, but it works really well for that. Mm. I find the same way that uh, with JavaScript. JavaScript is a good enough language that um, since that is what the browser understands natively, that's what we should use in the browser. Well, I use it through a transpiler and CoffeeScript, but sort of it boils down to the same thing. And I, that's really what plays through this whole thing, that since Rails has such a broad scope, it wants to solve so many different kinds of problems, to think that we can do all of that work in a single language, in a single paradigm, I think it's a fool's errand. And I think mm. you end up in a place where you try to make a, a what is it, a square pick fin to a round hole or the right. other way and, right. and you lose out from it. Because oftentimes that single idea is a great fit for 80% of the work. And then for the last 20%, it, it's a real hassle. Um, one of the most... Uh, memorable moments of this was when I discovered XSLT, which is this transformation language for uh, XML documents. This is back in early 2000s. And I thought, wow, that's such a cool concept. And I looked at a bunch of things that were really easy to do, things that were quite complicated. And then I hit a couple of really easy problems that were just almost impossible to do. And I mm. went, oh, okay, this whole idea of driving that whole thing through and building my entire view that way, mm, not so interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so after that, I've, I've not just from that, but in general influence that um, most single ideas cannot cover the problem space that I'm interested in solving. They all break down in various different ways. So if you instead create a patchwork where you use the things that are really well suited for their intended purposes for that one part of it that they're really well suited for. And another thing 
for the part that that's really well suited for, you end up having a much greater likelihood of getting something that solves all of your problems in a way where you feel good about it. Mm, okay. Engineers love automation, and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. You wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing. Get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. So we've talked a lot about Rails, and I want to zoom out a bit and talk about uh, software in broader terms. You gave a keynote at RailsConf 2014, and you focused on the difference between software writing and software engineering. And I thought this was a very interesting distinction. What is the difference between software writing and software engineering? So first I'd say most people call themselves software engineers, I think, like to pretend that what they're doing is engineering, that they're applying mathematical and scientific approaches to a problem space. And that's how they arrive at the right solution that they are akin in some ways to um, civil engineers building bridges or skyscrapers. And a lot of the metaphors that we have in, again, I'm going to use that term, software engineering, are borrowed from those other disciplines. And I actually, I tend to think that that's a misappropriation in ways that are uniquely damaging to the kind of work that most people who build information systems face every day. I'm not at all saying that there isn't software engineering going on. I'm just saying when you're building web applications and in particular when you're building information systems, much of that work does not square well with the definition I have for engineering. Okay, but does so how does the so you so this is the contrast between the 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 traditional notion of software engineer and an information systems builder is there a contrast between a computer scientist and an information systems builder? Absolutely, I think there are completely different roles. As I okay. consider a computer scientist, is someone who advances the core science of the computer. Anyone who comes up with uh, a sort of new sorting algorithms or things that are actually hard science where you have input A and you get output B and you can do that transformation in a more or less efficient way and you can measure that on a stopwatch. Mm. Now, the way we build information systems, comparing the code of one information system A to information system B, can you compare that, generally speaking, on, on a stopwatch or some other scientific measurement to three decibels? No, you can't. There are auxiliary factors of it. Perhaps you can compare the performance that someone experiences using the system and so forth. But many of the attributes we care about when we build information systems are things like, oh, is this system easy to adapt to change? Can other programmers pick it up and understand it and, and make those changes? Um, how can a single programmer understand large parts of the system and in short order? In many ways, they're more about understanding the intent that someone was putting into it when they were, when they were making it, which is a very subjective uh, approach, which is right. that is far closer to the metaphor that I like to apply to this, which is writing. Um, when you compare two pieces of writing, most people, I'd say, at least when it's something that's describing something in the world, will say, oh, yeah, that piece is clearer than that piece. But to pin that down to a single, is that because they used more better punctuation? Is it because they used more headlines? Perhaps you can apply some of those things through heuristics, and there's certainly plenty of books on how to write well, but they're not at all the same kinds of 
methods of measurements that we would use for science. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you've said that some of what we do in software is actually kind of pseudoscientific, and we look at it as a science, but in actuality, it is pseudoscientific. What are the practices of software development that are pseudoscientific? I think it's exactly this process of looking at things that cannot be measured scientifically and then pretending that it can, pretending that we can come up with laws uh, about software engineering, right? Like there's the law of thermodynamics and that's, that's pretty scientific. Um, then there's the law of Demeter or other laws of software engineering that are really more just like guidelines at the very best. Um, not laws you can say, oh, well, these describe the fundamental principles of the software universe. And if you break these laws, well, you're not breaking these laws. These laws have predictable capabilities that you can put an input into it and then you can know what the output is. That is not true for the heuristics, guidelines, and at best patterns that we use to describe when we're building information systems. They're far more subtle and they have tons of variables that you cannot hold constant and you cannot control for. So when we pretend that we can and we pretend that what we're doing is a kind of science, we end up in a bad place. And I think this all stems from the language that we pick and the metaphors that we use. If we think of ourselves as software engineers, as people who are applying these rules of physics and chemistry and so forth to a problem space, we often end up just the wrong place when what we should be looking to for inspiration is, is the far more subjective sciences, and I say sciences in quotation marks here, like the social sciences, um, where we're not looking at things where we can control all the variables, where we're looking at a far more fussy people. Uh, picture where in many ways, as I say, we're analyzing French poetry. Right. We're analyzing things that do not have a clear result at the end of the day. It's not going to boil down to 2.45. So there, there is this saying, I think, about art where people will say you have to know the rules in order to know how to break them. Is there something to be said for learning software engineering through a lens that is uh, more rigorous and less about the artistic uh, side of things just for the sake of like learning, you know, oh, there's, you know, here's an advantage to static typing. Like we're, we're today we are learning the lesson on static typing. You will code this way in order to learn this explicit lesson. And then maybe as uh, students of computer science or software engineering, build up these these more explicit scientific lessons they will learn uh oh these are actually more subjective they're more on a gradient um you know so how, how i'm curious how this conversation fits into the education of the programmer i think that's a great point and i think that this is where it often goes wrong um if you take something like static typing it's very often presented in ways of true and false and clear or not scientific terms about how it's better, how it's more provable, how it makes your program more provable and all this other bullshit that, that comes out of it. <laughs> when we should be looking at it from more a sense of like different styles, different paradigms, uh, study the approaches to software engineering in many of the same ways that we would study the approaches to painting. Oh, here you have expressionism, here you have modernism, here you have all these different styles and flavors. Someone is not going to look at those and say, what? I mean, expressionism is obviously the better way of painting reality. Like that will always give you a better insight into the human condition. Of course they won't, right? Because we know that that's not the way art jives. But when it comes to programming and when it comes to looking at that in the scientific light, a lot of people actually think that, oh, well, static typing is just better because it leads to more provable programs and programs that have less defects. This is where we start making proclamations about outcomes that are entirely unwarranted and leads us to a really misconception about the differences between programming. Now, I'm not saying that as be ignorant of the different styles and categories of programming. I say the opposite. 
I'm saying embrace all of that, learn all of that. You should know what the difference is between a functional programming style and an object oriented programming style is simply such that you can put together this better patchwork as we just talked about. Um, oh, this is a better fit for this. This is a better fit for that. And not even just on the level of it's a better fit for the problem, but also on a level of it's a better fit for you. And I think mm -hmm. that's really where a lot of this goes astray, that there's this notion that we can just objectively find the best tool for the job. What mm. a load of crap. Do you think that um, the expressionist painter could be convinced that, uh, oh, if I just painted ultra realism, that's truly just a better tool for the job. The tool of the job of what? Making me happy as a, as a programmer, making me inspired and motivated to come up and iterate over good systems. I think there's this disregard for the programmer, the, the subject in these discussions that really was what drew me to Ruby, right? That Matt mm. sat down and said, um, all these other programming languages are talking about the programs and, and oh, functional um, styles or whatever. I'm going to focus on the programmer. I'm going to focus mm. on increasing the programmer's happiness. And you just go like, whoa. That is a very different, and at the time, and I still think, controversial idea that the mental state of the programmer and how the programming language relates to that state is important and is something for us to optimize for, and it's something for us to trade off against, that we can willfully make the program slower, that we can make the program language more complex if it serves the higher purpose of making the programmer happy. That's a unscientific, perhaps it's scientific on some level if you start diving into psychology and so forth, but uh, at least it's unscientific in the physics sense of it, right? Like we do not come up with laws of physics to make the person practicing physics feel better about his domain. Certainly. I'm, I, uh, I'm with you on all of that. Um, I am curious, like, do you think that there are any, I mean, so in physics or math or chemistry, you know, scientists are very focused on discovering immutable truths about their certain domain. Are there any immutable truths to software engineering, or is this just like total art? There is nothing that you can say for sure. Lots of truths. Um, uh, algorithmic uh, O notations and things like that. Certain <laughs> algorithms are, are O N, and certain are are, are are a different way, right? They're, so you can make deductions about things like that. Well, does this um, algorithm use more memory than that algorithm? As long as you're making proclamations about what happens to the computer, you can be scientific. You can be very scientific about uh, comparing program A to, com to program B. If they're both trying to produce the same outcome, you can measure memory consumption or speed or whatever else you want, right? Where it gets unscientific, or at least uh, hard to control the variables, is when you bring the programmer into the perspective. Um, mm. And when you bring sort of the larger system into the perspective, which is again about the programmer. Can programmers understand this? Can they make changes to it? And all these other things that actually turn out in many ways to be more important than the things that we can make scientific proclamations about. The speed of execution for a program at this stage in human history and the evolution of, uh, of hardware is very often, and I'd say the majority, vast, vast majority of cases actually when it comes to information systems is less important than the relationship between the programmer and that program. Totally. It's simply just not that important how fast something executes because we have ludicrously fast computers that are ludicrously cheap when you compare it to the origins of when computer science really needed to be very scientific because in 1964, economics were very different. Mm -hmm. So, okay, speaking of economics, I want to I zoom out even further and uh, shift to talking about software development uh, in the context of business. Uh, you had a recent article on Medium called Reconsider in which you urged startup engineering founders to reconsider the idea that it is necessary to raise funds. And I'm curious, when a company raises too much money, how does that negatively affect the way that engineering goes on at an organization? Well, I think it uh, 
puts an organization on a certain trajectory as soon as it raises any amount of money almost, as, as certainly as long as it gets on the VC treadmill, which is usually starts with the angel funding and so forth. Then you've locked in your path to achieve a certain outcome, which is sell the company or go public or fold within five to seven years after that Series A run, right? So that gives you a certain trajectory and a certain timeline that I think is it has a lot of consequences. The way we think about software and developing things, for example, at Basecamp, where we've now been around for 12 years with that application, is a different kind. Um, there's a longevity factor to things of, for example, investing into to Ruby on Rails and maintaining that, uh, that just makes sense on a, on a different level, I'd say. Then secondly, there's a lot of other just immediate factors that play into it when a company takes funding. A lot of it has to do with how quickly they need to make something happen and the number of people that they will hire to do so. I find it, generally speaking, um, and through observation and talking with people, and when you have large teams that are growing very quickly, you get a certain kind of software. And that certain kind of software is generally not a, the kind of software that I like to build, um, which is a more carefully grown approach where you start small and, and you end up big, perhaps uh, slowly over time. When you have X amount of millions in the bank, uh, sort of basically burning a, a hole in that uh, balance sheet, you have to spend it usually very quickly because you have to get certain growth rates. And absolutely that has an influence on the kind of software and the ways you build software. That It's not the way I want to build software. Again, I'm not saying that that's like universally bad and that you can't build good things like that. But if you, if you look at the code bases of, of even just the successes that come out of this, the, the Facebooks and so on of the world, uh, I don't know if most people would go and say like, oh yeah, that's a that's some stellar information uh, systems <laughs> in terms of the implementation and so forth on it. And I think that's not because Facebook is uniquely bad. It's because it's very hard to build substantial software in that time frame with that amount of people, and then end up with something where you can look at the inside of how it's made and go like, oh yeah, that's great. Hmm. Okay, so I mean, this is interesting because, like, the cost of starting a company has essentially gone down to zero dollars in many cases, and there are several reasons for this. I mean, s- server infrastructure, which used to be the main cost, has basically been commodified by AWS, and it costs zero dollars. Frameworks like Ruby on Rails they increase the productivity, or even like WordPress. Like, if you're not an actual software developer, or if you are a software developer and you want to just develop on WordPress, you can do that, and that has massive productivity gains. Why do people still feel a need to raise money despite all of these free resources? I think there's a couple of factors. One thing is uh, if they would like to have a big company very quickly, then if you have to hire other people, uh, what's happened too is that programmer salaries have gone up dramatically, right? So some people, myself included, are content saying, uh, Okay, when I started Basecamp, we started uh, as a side project with four people, and and we were a tiny company for a long time. Even today, I mean, we're a tiny company in the grand scheme of the size of software companies, less than 50 people. And that growth happened all organically on an organic time frame. I think a lot of people were just more impatient than that. If you want a swank office and 100 people working at your company in 12 months, mm, probably not going to get there through customer revenues, right? (laughs) Very few newly launched products uh, achieve that level of uh, revenue and profitability in such a short order. So you basically need to spend other people's money to get there. So that's one path of of getting there. I think the other part of it is uh, there is a uh, assumption from the whole industry that this is how you do things. Like, you, if you want to do something serious, if you want to make a serious uh, dent in the world, if you want to capture the whole market, this is what you have to do. Because maybe otherwise your competitor is going to do it. So you will lose out if you don't have the couple of millions in the bank to, to compete. Um, so a lot of it, I think, is, is driven by this fear. It's driven by um, impatience. And perhaps to some extent is also driven by, well, hey, if I can get someone else to take the risk, because I do not uh, 
assume that the, the risk that I take on, if I take the money, is, is one I need to care about when, I mean, that through my conversation with, with startup founders is, is something people then later come to regret, that the risk of not owning your company, the risk of not controlling your own destiny and timeline, the risk of not being able to build your software in this organic manner where you, you feel happy about it, um, those risks are usually not discussed at the time of the term sheet, right? Well, I, th- I think the other thing that you've touched on in some of your other writing is kind of this notion that uh, probably a lot of a lot of the people who may be raising funds and to, to try to go for the unicorn out billion dollar outcome um, may not have their goals completely uh, materialized in their brain because you know typically if you're somebody who likes building things, the goal is not to get to this point where you have like a billion dollar exit. The goal is to get to a point where you get to engage with the enriching, joyful work on a daily basis. So there's, you know, I, I, with- I think that's, that's overly flattering of most people's uh, motivations when it comes to building startups. I do not find that uh, that has resonance for a lot of people. Um, it does for some, for sure. Um, that was part of my resonance for starting a company that I... Well, wanted. what I, what I'm saying is that if, if people have the opposite motivation, they're going to end up unsatisfied. Like, if, 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 if the only outcome that they're going for is just... I mean, you, you've written about this. You said, like, the truest sources of happiness that you found are not are not money or popularity but flow and tranquility and this is this is totally consistent with with the uh experience that i've had so i I mean i'm with you that like it's not that like the startup founders um are targeting this flow and tranquility it's just that they're kind of short-sighted in thinking that if they go for the billions that will somehow lead to an outcome that has the flow and tranquility within it yeah, I think most people have not examined their own motivations that deeply. And I don't think that they've uh, introspected on what it is that truly makes them happy. Uh, and maybe some of them have, and they've come to different conclusions, completely fair. Um, I'd say when I talk to people about the things that make them happy and the sort of research that I've read, uh, the flow as you talk about, um, if you were truly trying to optimize for those things, flow and tranquility, um, going through the uh, VC uh, treadmill seems like a <laughs> funky way of getting from A to B. Um, or not even funky, unlikely. Um, because doomed if you don't and doomed if you do, the failure rate, which is high, is probably not going to lead you there because you were trying to uh, turn this uh, donkey into a unicorn in record times. So or you pumping it full of steroids of all sorts of kinds. Um, probably not a very tranquil experience. I've not talked to a lot of <laughs> BC-backed startup funders who talk about the tranquility of their day or how they're enjoying <laughs> the flow of the moment. Usually they're talking about how they're completely frazzled, how they're beset with paranoia of competitors or investors or whoever else it is that sets their current destiny um, and how they're working 80-hour days and how you have to hustle, hustle, hustle. None of these things are compatible, at least in my mind, with the uh, vision of having your day consist, consist of flow and tranquility. So okay. that's why I push back against this, right? Because I want to basically promote those two values and those two motivations, at least put them out there and say, hey, do you know how life could be if it consists of, of large parts of tranquility and flow? <laughs> it's a really good living. And that's what I'm trying to to say. I found what I consider to be a really good living that consists of much of those two things, right? So if you want that too, then don't go do this other thing that's very unlikely to lead to that. Okay, um, just to play the devil's advocate, because by and large, I'm totally with everything you just said. But to play the devil's advocate on the front of what you say about the, the low probability of success... Uh, there's this book by Peter Thiel, Zero to One, where uh, this idea of like probability over calculus, he says that this is kind of pernicious. When people, He says that when people start to believe that they're just playing this big lottery where they only have a probability of success rather than treating things as calculus where they are planning how they are going to succeed – that they've already psyched themselves into failure. So, uh, I mean, what do you think about Complete that? Do you, do you think there's... 
<laughs> Hogwash. Okay. <laughs> and I'll, I'll elaborate on that. Um, Is he saying that because he's a venture capitalist? I'm saying that because I think he had certain outcomes that were very fortunate. And <laughs> that was all just because he was completely awesome. And that he put this calculus forward. I was going to do these things, then I did this, these things, and then <laughs> this thing happened. Right? Uh, and I think, uh, I don't know if humble is the word that generally describes my demeanor in life, but I have a more humble approach to probability. That I think that I can set my calculus, that I can say, oh, I'm going to do these things, and I can put my best execution into it, and things can still go wrong. And I can still be a quote-unquote loser. I'm sure I'm a loser in Teal's view of the world. Like, <laughs> uh, I did not end up with a unicorn. I did not end up with all sorts of sort of dominating any industry. I did not end up uh, by any of these other metrics or, or achievements or accomplishments that we usually ascribe to the unicorns, which in the venture capital world, like that's the winners, right? The winners is this small group of unicorns who, who beat everyone else and who dominate people and uh, markets and make billions to people who are already rich. So. That was not my definition of success. So I think that that's what you really have to be careful about. Um, as I said, like Teal will call you probably a loser if you end up with a small five-person company where your day is full of tranquility and flow. Now, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit what Peter Teal thinks about your company? <laughs> if you end up in a place where you live your life happy with tranquility and flow, are you a loser? A loser to who? And why does that matter? Like, mm. I feel like I've won, right? I, I don't know what else I can do, how I can win harder than how I've won. <laughs> and I still have, uh, as I recount and reconsider, a tiny company by the juggernauts of software development, right? Like, there's not tens of thousands of people working at Basecamp, there's less than 50. And I mean, I'm not a billionaire. and all these other things, right? So I've lost on all those metrics, yet I consider the, the metrics that I cared about. The reasons why I set out to do what I wanted to do, well, I fulfilled those. So that's where the pushback comes from, is an uh, invitation for people to think more closely and more carefully about what are their criteria for success. Because if you adopt someone else's criteria for success, you also then adopt, generally speaking, their methods and their approach. Um, and if you then end up thinking, oh, shit, that was actually not what I thought success was like. Well, then you've been following this method and this approach that was going to lead you there. It's not making you happy. It's not making mm -hmm. you get the things you want out of life, which may be things other than being part of a three-comer club or, or <laughs> things that we talked about. Okay, so th this brings us towards a, a good closing point. I want to uh, wrap up with just kind of a question. Like, you learned to program in your early 20s, which is, uh, it's a later time than the stereotypical, you know, hacker who creates a world-changing technology, a Bill Gates or a Mark Zuckerberg. And we have several listeners who are new to coding. And some of them feel like, they're late to the game and they started coding too late. They're never going to become Mark Zuckerberg. What advice would you give to them to help them rethink that internal narrative that they can never become the, the prodigal unicorn? First of all, why do you want to become Mark Zuckerberg? Like Zuckerberg is Zuckerberg. How about you just become you? and the things that you want out of life, as we just talked about, that you examine your own motivations. Don't try to just adopt someone else's and certainly not someone's by name. Um, and the second thing I'd say is I learned to program late. I learned to drive race cars even later. I picked up photography at some late stage. Like I've never been early <laughs> on any of the either endeavors or hobbies I've chosen to pursue. And yet I've arrived at all those endeavors to a place where I feel really good about where I am, which is part of it to say is like, you don't have to be the best in the world of programming. Who the hell cares? Like if you can just get to a level of proficiency that allows you to do the things that you want to do, why is that not good enough? And why can't you just enjoy that journey? Um, and that level of proficiency is, is getting ever lower. If the, your purpose of learning programming is that you want to build some programs, 
never been easier. You've never had to have actually less skill, I'd say, to, to build things that are useful. Now, if your purpose is you simply want to enjoy the journey of learning, which I strongly support, it's, it's a lot of fun to learn how to get good at programming. Why are you in such a rush? Like the fun part of learning how to program, I'd actually say the fun part of learning how to program, I've had more fun when I knew less than I do now, right? I learn less new things about programming now, certainly on a relative basis than I did 10 years ago. Like the first time I picked up Ruby and it first opened my mind to what programming could be like, what a joyous time. What a wonderful yeah. experience to go through that. So in many ways, I envy people who now start from this position of the blank slate where they're picking things up from the first time. It's a joyous, wonderful time, which yeah. is a parallel uh, I often draw to starting businesses. I think that uh, in many cases, the, the most fun of, of the business journey is the first time you go through it. doesn't mean that it can't be fun on the other side and all these other things. just means that don't look at like all the things that you don't have and bemoan that. Uh, fall in love with the things that you have. Fall in love with the fact that you are a beginner. You get to enjoy this wonderful intellectual experience of learning how to program. I think one of the things that I've uh, been most fortunate to discover in my life, one of the things that brought me the most happiness in my life is to go through that journey and to experience all that flow and all that tranquility that came from learning it. I mean, count your lucky stars. Yeah. Well, that seems like a great place to close off. David, thanks for coming out of Software Engineering Daily. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I'm a big fan of Rails. I've used it for several applications, and uh, it's brought me a lot of joy. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me.